April 8th. Well, the theme of this talk was written with this date for Honor's Convocation in mind. It was intended not only to be timely, but also somewhat lighthearted. The times have changed, but I decided to keep the same talk, thinking that lightheartedness, like toilet paper, is now in short supply. But by keeping the same talk, you will note some anachronisms. Those of you playing along at home can keep track of how many temporal mistakes I make. My talk formally starts by thanking President Nugent, Provost Brodel, members of the Kemp Foundation, and the faculty and staff of IWU for the privilege of addressing our student honorees. I thank our current students and those from years past as those ultimately responsible for me being here. And a special thank you to my family who bore with me the last 12 months as I wrote and revised many versions of this presentation. I finally organized this talk like my general chemistry lectures. I start with a bit of science-related history, include a chemical of the day, then on with the main topic, with the demonstration if there is time. So on this date, in 1869, Harvey Williams Cushing was born. In 1902, he performed the first brain surgery in the US. He was the first to use x-rays and blood pressure measurements in the surgical practice. He discovered the role of the pituitary gland, and he introduced the practice of using a saline rinse for irrigation of surgery wounds. We'll come back to Dr. Cushing's work later, but for now, just note his use of a saline rinse on surgical wounds. The term saline refers to aqueous salt solutions, and our chemical of the day is sodium chloride, common ordinary salt. But don't worry, this won't be a lecture on the chemistry of sodium chloride. Fascinating though that is, instead we'll look at the extraordinary role that ordinary salt has played in our bodies and in society from ancient times to modern and salt's religious, economic, and political significance. Humans and salt have a long and amazing history together. The connection may go back to the start of life on Earth, which some think began in the ocean, since the cells in our body reflect a salty, aqueous origin. The human body has roughly 250 grams of salt, or about three to four salt shakers full. We lose five to 10 grams of salt from our body every day. Urine, sweat, tears all remove salt, as does loss of blood. Our bodies need salt for a variety of reasons. One example, every cell in our body has special pores that allow sodium ions to move back and forth across the cell membrane. The resulting concentration difference makes tiny batteries that do electrical signaling. Our nerves and muscle fibers are activated by those electric signals. That's how the muscles I am using to talk are triggered. That is how your perception of sound travels from your ear to your brain. And that is how the many nerve cells in your brain signal back and forth in a way that elicits meaning from those signals. Our need for salt is in a real sense hardwired in us. But symptoms for low salt levels are vague. Headaches and weakness, followed by lightheadedness and nausea, followed by death. Well, natural selection solves that problem, possibly by our surviving ancestors having developed an enhanced sense of taste for saltiness, or perhaps a psychological craving for salt. Salt cravings in today's humans, however, are reported to be most often triggered by boredom. Well, you can easily satisfy your salt craving soon, but what about our human ancestors two million years ago? Salt is a solid mineral, a rock, and humans do not have the habit of eating rocks. At that time, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, and the red meat they ate was rich in salt. For example, the Maasai, current nomadic cattle herders, meet all their salt needs by bleeding their cattle and drinking the blood. But when some of our ancestors changed from hunting and gathering to an agricultural-based food supply, a diet of grains and vegetables would likely not provide enough salt. Even supplementing their diet with occasional meat from slaughtered domestic livestock would not necessarily provide the salt needed. The free-range Maasai cattle can find their own salt, but cattle confined to a farm cannot. Instead, they have to be provided salt by their human owners in the form of a commercial salt lick. Herbivores in the wild sometimes find natural salt licks, outcroppings of solid salt 
formed from the evaporation of water from salt springs. Humans entering new territories may have learned to track animals to find these sources of salt. That area would not only provide good hunting, it would be a source for humans to collect salt for their own use. Communities historically grew up around salt resources. It'd be ill-advised to settle far away from a critical need. As we'll see, there is a large demand for salt. It is a bulky commodity. And transporting salt any distance on land is a pain without a good road system. And if we're talking roads, that inevitably leads us to Rome. The Roman Empire built many roads, but the earliest is thought to be the Via Salaria, the salt road, which started at Porta Salaria, the salt gate in the walled city, and ran east to some salt marshes on the Adriatic. This connected Rome to a means of salt production. The Romans built their roads not only to move their armies quickly, but also to establish commerce. Much of the early trade was in salt, but the Romans soon realized that it was more efficient to set up salt works along the way that could supply the salt their armies would need when on the march and use excess salt for trade. This connection among salt, armies, and money is thought to be the origin of our words salary and soldier. The original technique for making salt was a bit primitive. A large clay pot was filled with salty water and heated over a fire. As water boiled off, more salt water was added. Eventually, after burning an enormous amount of wood, the clay pot would be filled with a solid lump of low purity salt. The clay pot was then broken to get the salt block. This may partially answer the question why some excavated Roman sites have tons of broken and charred pottery. Over time, they learned to use solar heating to evaporate the water. This was done in stages with a dozen or so separate large basins dug into the earth at various elevations. The first and highest was the starting solution. Seawater, if necessary, or perhaps brine from a salt marsh, which would be preferable since it was already higher in salt concentration. As the sun caused the water to evaporate, the salt became more concentrated. It was then drained into the second lower basin for additional concentration, and the process was repeated. Well, seawater starts out at about 3.5% total salts. Of this total salts, about three-fourths is sodium chloride, which is the most soluble. The rest are mostly magnesium, calcium, and iron salts. Between the third and the sixth basin, those other salts began to precipitate as solids, with the remaining solution becoming more and more concentrated in sodium chloride. In the final basin, the liquid is highly concentrated in relatively pure salt. Current salt production facilities, such as pictured here, still use this procedure. The saturated salt solution is often red at this point, as it is easily contaminated by an odd microorganism, Dunanelia salina. It is odd in that it can survive at this high salinity, which very few microorganisms can do. That's important. And it is odd in that it produces beta carotene, which gives tomatoes and carrots their color. The salt that first starts to crystallize at the surface is called fleur de sel, a premium fine-grained white salt sought by connoisseurs. There are well over a hundred specialty salts of varying colors commercially available. Hawaiian alea salt is red, from the volcanic clay impurities mixed in with the salt. Hawaii also produces a black lava salt where minerals leached from lava, lava contaminate the sodium chloride. Himalayan salt from Pakistan is pink due to several trace impurities, including iron. But absolutely pure sodium chloride is what color class? Colorless. Sorry, no partial credit for guessing blue. That's just the color of the background. Solid salt can often be directly obtained by scraping the surface of dried rivers and lake beds found in some deserts. By getting a load, but getting a load of salt back across a desert was a real logistical problem. By the Middle Ages, camels were domesticated, and they were used to transport these scrapings. Later, huge deposits of solid salt near the surface were found in the Sahara. Numerous 200-pound blocks of salt were carved out, and two such blocks were placed on each camel. Reports of caravans with camels numbering in the thousands were common at this time, arriving in Timbuktu, a key trading station in Mali. That is a lot of salt. The 14th century emperor of Mali, Mansa Musiketa, 
is thought by some historians to have been the richest human ever, due mostly to the salt trade. But why so much salt and so much money? The driving force in the Middle Ages was the use of salt as a food preservative. That story seems to have begun much earlier in pre-dynastic Egypt. The land immediately adjacent to the Nile River for a couple of miles on either side was arable. Beyond that narrow belt was desert. The river tributaries and lakes that had been there evaporated long ago, concentrating salt and letting it mix with the encroaching sand. With little land available for growing food, human burial occurred in the nearby desert. The cadavers discovered there today as the sands shift are not mummies, but are surprisingly well preserved, still with flesh and skin. And a similar site would have greeted burial parties when they went out around 3000 BC. Such a gruesome discovery was likely a seminal moment for those early Egyptians. Their fascination with the afterlife and religious ceremonies, the elaborate making of mummies and pyramids, all likely flowed from such observations. The dry air of the desert and the saltiness of the soil preserved the buried bodies. Eventually, the Egyptians began to deliberately mummify the dead. Simple salt, sodium chloride, was used to preserve bodies from the lower classes. Higher class individuals were mummified using natron, a naturally formed but rarer mixture of sodium chloride, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium carbonate. While sodium chloride salt is neutral, natron is basic and thus even better able to kill off bacteria. As the preserving nature of salt became religiously significant to the Egyptians, the same happened to the Jews. In the Torah, the sacred agreement between God and his chosen people were called salt covenants, indicating their eternal nature. On the Sabbath, it's customary for Jews to eat bread dipped in salt. The bread may symbolize the joy of gathering and the salt may symbolize the holy nature of that gathering and the preservation of the covenants. In Shintoism, salt purifies locations. The salt ceremony preceding a sumo wrestling match reflects this. In the Buddhist tradition, after a funeral, salt is thrown over your left shoulder to prevent evil spirits from following you. In the Christian tradition, Jesus instructed his followers to be the salt of the earth, possibly meaning that they should help preserve humanity from the corruption of sin. Given its holy associations, the accidental spilling of salt is seen as an evil omen. In The Last Supper, da Vinci incorporates many details, including Judas spilling a dish of salt used for dipping bread. What the Egyptians learned by studying the mummification process was then applied to food preservation. Salted meat and salted fish began to appear in food offerings left for the deceased in their burial rituals, and details of the making and use of salt in preserving food appeared in murals painted on the walls inside the pyramids. Salt is a preservative of animal and plant tissue because it excels at tying up the water in the tissue. By depriving the bacteria of water, salt can kill off bacteria. Let's do a demo. I could show you the actual preservation of food using salt, but you'd have to be very patient because it would take several weeks to observe the effect. So instead, we're going to use a model system. Uh, Animal tissue, for example, is mostly water. So I'm starting here with water and a little bit of food color to make it more visible. And uh, the, that kind of biological tissue has organic polymers dissolved in water, which is what I'm adding here. Uh, as I add uh, the polymer to the water, I need to stir it in. Uh, this particular polymer, by the way, is uh, made from corn but it's uh, engineered a bit in the laboratory to make it a super absorbent polymer. As the polymer chains start off, they're bundled up like loosely bound uh, wall, uh, ball of yarn, uh, but as they start to dissolve in the water, that ball unwinds and the thread of yarn comes out and starts to stick out into solution. So it takes a little while to uh, get the polymer to dissolve, but as it does, that uh, yarn uh, of uh, organic polymer that sticks out is starting to interact strongly with the water and absorb to it. Uh, this is a super absorbent polymer that can absorb over 100 times its weight in water. 
And what has happened is that uh, that polymer has set up a three-dimensional network which has changed that liquid into what is more of a uh, gel here, a semi-solid. Uh, and what we have now is our model system of an aqueous system with organic polymers dissolved in it. Uh, as such, if this were uh, animal tissue, this would be a tasty snack for bacteria to chow down on. But what we're going to do is try to prevent that by adding ordinary salt. As I pour the ordinary salt in here and stir it in, uh, there's going to be a contest between this super water absorbent polymer and the salt. And what we see is that that uh, three-dimensional network, that semi-solid gel, has been destroyed and we're back to being a free-flowing liquid. What we've seen here is actually two different things. One is that the salt won that contest, wrestling the uh, water away from the control of the polymer. And that shows how water is able to remove enough water to make it impossible for the bacteria to uh, digest the organic material in the first place. The second thing that happened is that those uh, polymer chains are changing their conformation as a result of having salt added to it. And that can change the nutritional value of food. Uh, olives is, is one example. As picked from the tree, olives are essentially inedible, even when totally ripe. It's only after they are soaked in a salt solution, if they're cured that way, uh, that they become, in fact, edible and, and tasty. Uh, note also the uh, medical term cure uh, in describing what happens as food is treated with salt, as in curing a ham. Salt became essential by making food available for large-scale and long-distance commercial trade. Lots of wealth changed hands, and governments paid attention. China began a salt tax and used the profits to build the Great Wall. Ancient Rome used a salt tax to fund the Punic Wars. When Rome finally fell, salt production moved north to Venice, located on islands with salt marshes that made salt production highly profitable. In time, the Venetians learned that there was even more money to be made by moving away from just the manufacture of salt and into monopolizing all aspects of the salt trade buying, reselling, and transporting salt. They became the Amazon of the Middle Ages with a huge commercial fleet that became a powerful navy. The Venetians built amazing architecture from the riches they drew from the sea in the form of salt. Ironically, with rising sea levels, that splendid architecture, this one looking like a ship, is now sinking back into the sea. Salt often appears in the fall and rise of governments. The French Revolution was fueled in part by the citizens' hatred of the gabelle, the royal salt tax. Ninety years ago this week, Mahatma Gandhi initiated a nonviolent overthrow of British colonial rule in India with his march to the sea to make salt. That violated a law that all salt in India had to be purchased from the British, but Gandhi convinced his countrymen that making salt was an undeniable human right. There are many proverbs or common saying about salt. One website listed 287 examples. I will close by mentioning just two. But if I did read you all 287 sayings, I might be said to be rubbing salt in the wound, commonly interpreted as compounding an injury, like kicking someone when they're down or twisting the knife but a closer look finds this interpretation problematic. Putting salt in a wound does cause pain, but is it necessarily nasty in its intent, like twisting a knife? Salt is, after all, an antiseptic, one of the few that's been available throughout human history. Sailors, in particular, were known to use salt as an effective, albeit painful, disinfectant at a time when even a small cut getting infected could prove fatal. Also, remember Harvey Williams Cushing? He began the practice of rinsing surgical wounds with salt water. Finally, I end with one last saying about salt that relates to this year's theme of fact or fiction. We are told to consider evidence and arguments with a grain of salt. Figuratively, that encourages us to be somewhat skeptical, 
not to believe everything we see or hear. For example, maybe salt is not really white. Maybe putting salt in a wound is not always bad. Note we're advised to take a grain of salt, not a pound or a cupful. Too much skepticism becomes cynicism, which can lead to dismissing inconvenient facts as fake news. And why salt in the expression? Why not a grain of rice? The original Latin expression, cum grano salis, commonly translates as with a grain of salt. Sal salis is Latin for salt, but has a secondary meaning of wit or wisdom. Those terms apply to an understanding of the human condition and of ourselves. When we're advised to take a grain of salt, we are also asked to take that skepticism, that preservative from error, and apply it to our own thinking, for our own benefit, to cure our prejudices. We should question our own opinions with the same skepticism we apply to the opinions of others. And that little grain of salt can have a very big effect. Thank you.